graduates here to deliver grand rounds this morning. I uh, thought for the benefit of the medical students in particular, I'd give you a little background about uh, Ralston Major. Um, a while back we did a survey of our faculty and some of the residents about why you went to medical school and one of the, one of the answers that people gave was uh, it was expected of me. And I don't know if that was the case for Ralston or not, but it certainly with his lineage would, uh, would leave that open. Uh, his grandfather uh, was a physician, a uh, graduate of the University of Louisville, who ended up down in LaGrange, Georgia, and he ended up uh, starting or participating in the establishment of a very large multi-specialty group that provides health care for a huge uh, segment of the, of the population that lived down there. Uh, then along came two sons, uh, one of them Dr. Grant Major back there, and then Paul Major, his brother, uh, both of whom were are, were surgeons in LaGrange, or are surgeons in LaGrange, now with Grant. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Paul this last year. Uh, but both of them graduates of our surgery residency here uh, as well. Uh, Ralston was born uh, here at Erlanger while Grant was a resident uh, here. Grant's uh, uncle, by the way, is a surgeon in McMinnville, uh, his, his mother's brother, who also trained here. And now, of course, his brother is a resident here. Uh, so the family uh, embodies what I've said many times. If you're around us for a while and are honored to have the, participate in the education of people at the end of every day, you can have the good feeling that an awful lot of people have received excellent health care today because of things that happen here. And the major's family uh, embodies that probably better than, than anybody I know in medicine in terms of one local uh, training program that, uh, that, that, that is, has done that. Uh, we also have, by the way, I'd, I'd like to recognize people when they come back and visit uh, Dr. Worthington back there. Raise your hand, Dr. Worthington. He's about to expand the potential for <laughs> medical care. His wife's upstairs being induced to have a, a, a little boy, and he is a graduate of our residency as well, decided he would show up down here rather than be a nervous father sitting alone upstairs. So we're happy to have him here as well. Ralston uh, uh, had always had an interest in doing a, being a general surgeon as his father and his uncle, both uncles are. Uh, and so that's what he's done. And we're really happy that he's come back to visit with us because he's going to tell us about starting up a general surgery practice and uh, the transitions to practice, I guess. Ralston, we're always glad to have you back. Thank you, Dr. Burns, uh, and, and thank everybody for uh, having me back. It's certainly an, an honor to come back and, and great to see everybody. Um, I thank Dr. Burns for dinner last night. I wish I'd gotten a picture before Dr. Burns left. This was uh, towards the end of the night, but uh, we, we went out last night for dinner, and it's great to... Um, yeah, you know, see old friends and catch up. So I don't have any disclosures. I'm not an expert in contracts or building a practice or anything. This is just simply my experience, you know, transitioning into practice and building a practice. And so as far as the outline, um, I'm going to start with my uh, decision to go into general surgery. And some of the things I did my chief year, which I felt, you know, helped prepare me for that transition. And then uh, ultimately going back home, building a practice. And uh, if we have time um, go over a couple of cases. So I got to apologize to Dr. Maxwell. I'm going to use one of his quotes. Uh, so, you know, starting out with residency, um, it's when you go through residency and everybody knows this, you figure out what you like and what you don't like and, and it changes. And so, you know, as a junior resident, I got to scrub some cases with Dr. Dr. Sprouse and Dr. Greer and Dr. Joel's and those guys. And most of them were, you know, these open vascular cases. I, and I, I, very much enjoyed and I still I love you know I love doing vascular and I ended up uh, presenting at Southern Association for Vascular Surgery as an intern and uh, thought I wanted to go into vascular and I was I guess it was the second year and I was sitting there with, with uh, Darren Hunt was my chief he was letting me do a gallbladder I was taking it off the hepatic foss and Dr. Maxwell comes up behind me so doc I hear you might want to twiddle wires for the rest of your life <laughs> so I'm sitting there thinking I was like man go home look up twiddle you know <laughs> purposeless you know so, uh, and of course, moved through residency and, and, did, and, and there, there's a, a huge endovascular approach now. And uh, 
and I, I like the open stuff. So I, I thought, well, maybe I'll make this part of my general surgery practice. And then as a more senior resident, I, you know, got, uh, you know, had an incredible experience with Dr. Hedrick and, and, and really fell in love with thoracic surgery uh, to the point where I actually uh, I applied. I was accepted to um, fellowship at University of Toronto, which is, you know, a good thoracic program. And I was torn, you know, I always thought I'd go back home, wanted to go back home, love thoracic, you know, there's no thoracic surgery back home. Uh, and my chief year, my Uncle Paul was diagnosed with a, uh, with a glioblastoma, and that, you know, that sort of changed things. Uh, certainly there was going to be, uh, if there was not already, a, more, more of a need for a general surgeon back home. And I remember Dr. Hedrick telling me, you know, this may be life trying to, trying to steer you in the right direction. And, uh, and I, I think he was right with that. So ultimately I did decide to go back home and, and, uh, and pursue uh, general surgery. So chief year. Um, you know, it's, our program affords us a you know opportunity to really t tailor your your chief year and tailor your residency uh, to what you're going to do, and I think that's a you know, huge benefit. And as a chief resident, it's really good to know what type of practice you're going into. And I use carotid and direct-to-me as a perfect example. If I was going into most general surgery practices, I wouldn't you know, probably wouldn't be doing carotids. But you know, for the past 25 years in Lagrange, Georgia, Dad and Uncle Paul, uh, Dad and Uncle Paul have been doing carotids, and uh, and I knew that, and so going in, I, you know, I built up, you know, I worked with the vascular guys my chief years and did a bunch of carotids, and, and that's something that, uh, uh, you know, that, that I've continued and is a substantial part of my practice. Um, so, you know, as, as, a, as a chief, you sort of tailor uh, what you're going to be, what you're going to be doing or what you think you might be doing with the same thing, uh, dialysis access. I, I was thinking, man, that's something I could bring back home. So I did a lot with uh, the vascular guys doing dialysis access. Turns out all the nephrologists in Lagrange own access centers uh, down in Columbus, 30 minutes down the road, up in Noonan, 30 minutes up the road. They're, I don't do any dialysis access, but try to try to focus on what you're going to be uh, doing, and uh, and and that I think that helps that transition. Uh, I did want to bring something back home that wasn't being done, and you know. A simple thing was fine needle aspirations. Uh, they weren't doing FNAs, you know. When Dad, you know, with th his thyroid patients, you know, they'd go up to Emory, he'd get the, you know, the pathologist up at Emory to do FNAs, and and that seems like a, a small, simple thing, but you know, Chief here, you know, did a lot of uh, office with Dr. Giles and Rowe, and, and you know, learned how to do those FNAs, and that ended up being huge. I mean, really opened up an endocrine practice that, uh, you know kept me busy and and you know that was a, a big thing I think for those patients not driving an hour you know up to Atlanta and then thoracic surgery was uh was probably the biggest thing for the hospital because there was no thoracic surgery being done and uh I'll show you as far as my cases you know later on in the presentation but uh you know doing thoracic surgery uh, I think is, has been one of the biggest uh, things I was able to bring back and, and has been beneficial to me and beneficial to the community chief year make sure you get a picture with Dr. Burns this is uh this was my you know, my chief year. I wasn't sure if Dr. Burns would let me get a picture with him, especially in the OR with hip and everything. So I got one of the circulating nurses down in Plaza to sort of nonchalantly snap a shot. Contract negotiations. Uh, as I said, I'm not a, an expert in contracts. This is Dr. Creel here. He was my orange chief. He was signing his contract to go to Gainesville, Georgia. But there's lots of different components to a contract. You've got your moving allowance, typically, you know, five ten thousand dollars $10,000. Signing bonuses, typically around $25,000. Um, and this is based, again, I'm not a contract expert, but, you know, this is based on the, the three different contracts that, that I looked at and had. Um, student loan forgiveness, uh, I, I wasn't offered that, but, but many contracts offer that, and residency stipend I wasn't offered, but if you are, especially early on, if you're able to lock in, uh, you know, you can, you can pick up a residency stipend. Non-compete clauses um, are in many contracts. I do have one of those in mind, and that's something to be, be mindful of, um, you know. Uh, and then prof professional and educational allowances. You know, are they going to allow me to go to Southeastern Surgical? You know, are they going to, you know, do this and that and and continue medical education and licenses? Oftentimes, they'll uh, have an allowance for those uh, expenses. Different compensations, RVU, relative value units. That's every procedure you perform has a relative value unit, um, and so many and, and office visits have relative value units. So, if uh, you know, many contracts are based on RVUs. I perform, I get so many RVUs, you know, and I, I meet this, you know, salary. And so many, and then oftentimes with RVU-based systems, there's an incentive. So if I get over 6,500 RVUs, I've, I, I get this incentive. 
So that's uh, that's a common way contracts are being more commonly now than in the past. And then the other way, which is the way I'm I'm uh, reimbursed, is based on collection. So if I do a self pay gallbladder, I don't get anything. If I do a Blue Cross gallbladder, I get I get reimbursed. Uh, you know the full for that um and there's pluses and minuses uh obviously to both but those were the two tri types of contracts that i was between i would you know for the chiefs i'd you know i think it's a good idea to get multiple interviews even if you know where you're going i think it's a good idea to get multiple interviews and, and get you know see see different aspects uh and and different opportunities uh if you're not happy to counter offer the i went with emory they lowballed me uh, i came back with the counter offer and it's like anything you know if you if they want you, they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll get you. And Craig Serene, I'm not sure if Craig is still here, but he was invaluable. Uh, all four of the chief, me and the three other chiefs I, I uh, finished with, he was very helpful in, with the contracts. And we, you know, you don't know what you're getting into, and so having somebody this experienced that will, that will look over that and, and know those aspects, I think is, uh, you know, it was a huge opportunity for us, um, you know, here at this program and with University Surgical. So as I said, ultimately I decided to go back to LaGrange, which is my hometown. Uh, LaGrange is um, town, it's about 35,000 people. It's right on the Georgia-Alabama border, right there. Uh, top right corner, um, this is the Callaway Mansion. Many of you may have heard of Callaway Golf. The Callaways are from LaGrange, uh, started a mill, Callaway Mills, back uh, many years ago. and. Um, that's a, a big reason LaGrange is a nice town. The, the Callaway Foundation continues to pump money into it to keep it a nice town. So bottom left, uh, that's uh, Lafayette. He is a, um, a general, French general, back in the Revolutionary War that was a supporter of independence. And I don't know if any of you know French, but LaGrange is the barn or, or the farm in French. And uh, he thought LaGrange looked like his farm back home, and so that's how we got our name. And then the bottom right, that's West Point Lake. Uh, a lot of good bass fishing. It's about a... 30,000 acre uh, extension off the Chattahoochee River there in LaGrange. So made the decision to go back home. Then I had the decision, am I going to go with the hospital or the group? Uh, the group, uh, as Dr. Burner said, a multi-specialty group uh, that my, my grandfather you know, put 43 years into and my father is part of us with Emory. Emory bought us out probably 10 years ago. It's a multi-specialty based practice. And we got a lot of different specialists. Uh, I think uh, the big, the two big numbers there they had three general surgeons when I was looking into starting and they had 50 about 55 percent of the primary care a very good primary care base um, and and they offered me a base salary which is around the 25th percentile MGMA which is what basically what everybody's you know uh, compared uh, all the surgeons are compared across the country and then they said you know we'll pay you this until uh, you decide you want to go on production and then you can go on production um, and so that was the, the one contract I had. The second contract uh, I looked at back home was with the hospital, West Georgia Medical Center. Now it's been bought out by Wellstar, which is a, a large uh, hospital group uh, out of Atlanta. Uncle Paul, my Uncle Paul was with, uh, with this group. And as I said, Uncle Paul got diagnosed with a, a glioblastoma, and we knew that his time was running, you know, running short, and it was, a, it was a tough, very difficult decision. The hospital had five general surgeons uh, versus three. Uh, and they had about 10% of the primary care versus 55%. They did offer me a, a substantially larger salary, uh, and they gave me an RVU incentive. But, uh, you know, I looked at the surgeons there, aside from Uncle Paul, they really weren't that busy. Um, they were getting pretty hefty salaries and, and you know, sort of sitting around like, and not doing as much. And I, I felt like I wouldn't be happy going into the system where I was where I was uh, sitting around. So I ultimately, difficult phone call, I think, uh, I think it was doc, Dr. Hyde or Dr. Kessner, one of the two, maybe both of them were up in the up in the lounge. My chief here and I called Uncle Paul to let him know, and it was that was one of the toughest phone calls I had to make. But I I think it was the right decision, uh, and he, you know, he I think he agreed. And I had multiple discussions with a lot of Dr. Burns and a lot of the uh, a lot of the attendings about which way to go, and ultimately I did decide to go with Dad with the uh, with Emory. So. I started July 1st. We we finished up here. had had the chief roast, and I went back home, and uh, and I wanted to wanted to get started as soon as possible. And I, you know, that was I don't know. That's something Dad. You know, when he started, he said, "Yeah, I started July 1st," and you know, and, and for whatever reason, I wanted to just go ahead and get started rather than take time off. So I did start right away, obtaining privileges. Um, you know, sign up for privileges. We'll talk more about that. Uh, you know, down the road. Primary care visits. This is something that I think was very important. Uh, was very helpful. Um, 
you know, when I got there, I went around to all the primary care doctors and, and, you know, some of them I knew, many of them I didn't introduce myself, gave them a card, wrote my cell phone number on the back of it. And, and I think that face to face was, was important. And, um, and it's not hard to do. You're not starting out crazy busy. You've got time. So that's something for the chiefs. I would, you know, I would certainly recommend doing go and just starting to build those relationships. Marketing, you know, they put an ad for me in the paper. Emory did. It's, you know, just to get your name out there. That's something that, you know, I think starting out is 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 not a bad thing. Uh, and then, you know, having niches. You know, I sort of did endocrine as, as a niche, um, and they they sort of marketed uh, me that way. And that was, you know, good or bad. That was something I think you know helped help get some of those referrals early on. And then partners. You know, your partners are huge. Office. Um, you know, follow up. You know, how wh- how long do I you know follow a carotid patient after I do a carotid endarterectomy, or how long do I follow a breast patient, or how often do I see them back? And so that's something that you know, Dad and my other partners helped me out you know, tremendously in post op. You know, when do I see a patient back? You know, for a gallbladder two weeks. You know, for a hernia three weeks because Dr. Arnold says they hurt so much for three weeks. Wait till three weeks so they won't be mad at you when they come back. Uh, coding, yeah, you know, coding. You don't. You know, I, at least I didn't get much experience at all with coding. I worked with Dr. Giles uh, my chief year, and he, he helped me uh, just learn how with the office and, uh, and hospital, you know, the different levels that you can charge and that kind of thing. And Dr. Stanley helps with that as well. But that's a lot of that stuff you, you figure out in practice, and, and your partners are huge. And, and then in the operating room, you know, starting out, assist, assist, and, uh, and let them assist you. Like I said, you're not going to be crazy busy starting out, so getting in the OR. You know, if nothing else, just getting to know the, the circulators and the scrubs and, and everything. I think assisting uh, is something that's important early on and, and helpful. Boards. Uh, so I took my boards uh, written as soon as I could. You know, I finished in July 2015, August 2015. 15, I went ahead and took my boards. Preparation, everybody's got different methods for preparing for the boards. I did CSAP. I thought that was, you know, very, very helpful. And then um, oral boards, I did January of 2016. Uh, How to Win was uh, is a book that I think is, is very beneficial because it shows you basically almost every scenario they're going to give you. And so you have an idea of what, you, what you're going into. Uh, you know, that's one thing Dad told me, you know, the, you don't discount the benefit of if you're going into general surgery, six months of general surgery practice because, you know, you, you answer stuff and you just tell them what you would do. And that, for, for me, I thought that was very, you know, very beneficial, having six months of practice and then and then doing it because you're, uh, you know, you've are you been doing it for six months and you just tell them what you would do. And then the Oslo Review course. So this is something that, you know, back and forth, I will say uh, I thought it was, I'm not sure how much it helped me as far as preparation, but it was a definitely a conf- confidence booster. We had a, th- uh, I think it was a car thoracic fellow. He had a, uh, you know, they give you these mock orals, and everybody, you know, hears your answers, you know, and uh, incarcerated inguinal hernia. Uh, and this guy was sick, and they kept on getting, try to go to the OR, try to go to the OR, and the, this, you know, this uh, guy that was taking the course with me, you know, finally he said, all right, I'll take him to the OR. And so, Ends up giving him a divert, you know, diverting ileostomy, you know, for an incarcerated hernia, and uh, and there, you know, there's some of these things you're just thinking, man, I'm I'm going to be okay, you know, so uh, again, it's, I th- felt it was a confidence booster. Areas of interest, uh, so privileges, get them when you start, you know, there, and I, I mean, for me, I just sign up for almost everything, you know, they're easy to get, uh, you know, uh, vascular, bariatrics, general, thoracic, you know, and and so I would, I would, I would tell you to get privileges for everything because once you once you give them up, they're they're not easy to uh, they're not easy to get as uh, as some of my senior some of my partners let me know. So this is uh, this was one of my partners. If you see here, uh, July second, 2015. So this is my second day of practice, and uh, you know did a thyroid and uh, my partner got done and you know, put staples in and put a drain at the end. So this is my text to Dr. Giles. He had one response, wow. <laughs> we do, uh, you know, smaller and, you know, smaller incisions. It's not right or wrong. It's just uh, the way I was trained. Uncle Paul would get so mad at me when he'd scrub a gallbladder or scrub a thyroid with me because I would say, you can't see anything, you know. But, uh, but you know, I, I sort of, the FNAs and, and, and sort of marketing as a, as a endocrine guy, I was able to, you know, start uh, gain a lot of, uh, referrals and surgeries and endocrine surgery. Bariatrics, my partner Charlie Ferguson did bariatrics 
He actually uh, went out uh, this year. He had a trigger finger deformity. Went out on disability in January. So I didn't get into bariatrics while he was doing it because I didn't want to cut into his practice. But my chief year, I did. I did. You know, do a lot of cases with Dr. Sanborn, and that was something I was able to transition to. And 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 I'm not doing a lot of it, but uh, but I do, you know, a couple cases a month. Um, vascular veins. My chief year, I, as I said, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, with, with Dr. Dr. Greer, Dr. Joel's, um, Dr. Fisher, they, you know, doing veins over at the, uh, over at the, uh, SSB. And that was, uh, something my other partner, Dr. Ayers, who's been with my dad for many years, he, he was doing veins and he, uh, and I knew he was, you know, getting close to retirement. So that was something that I kind of came into. And then thoracic surgery, um, you know, I'm not doing any lobectomies, um, but uh, decortications, you know, pleurodesis, that kind of thing. Uh, there's, uh, you know, that, that's been more cases than I would have thought. This is a picture down at the bottom. That's my first uh, sleeve gastrectomy that I did uh, earlier this year. And they want to take a picture of it. Call, uh, our call when I started was one to seven. We had seven surgeons sh sharing call. Now our Uncle Paul's out and Charlie Ferguson's out. So now we're one in five. We do a week of call at a time. So I'll start Monday, 7 a.m. And I'll go through the following Monday at 7 a.m. Um, during the week, we're on call for our own patients. So if I do a, you know, collect me on a patient, they have a problem on a Wednesday night, they're going to call me. But on a weekend, we check out and we take for everybody's patient. And big thing I would say here is take extra call. Um, that was something that, uh, that Dr. Burns had told me, you know, starting out and, and, you know, it's, it's a, I think it's a very good way to build a practice. I think your senior partners uh, appreciate it. Um, but you know, those those call patients are the ones that really, you know, and oftentimes are, are very uh, uh, very satisfied. You know, the eight year old that comes in with appendicitis, and those are the parents that go out and and uh, and talk about you know say, well, you know, Dr. Went, he's, Dr. Major took care of me, and so I think that's a great way to build a practice is take an extra call. Uh, block time, you know, if you can get block time. They wouldn't give me block time after my first year. I, I couldn't even get cases on. I was, if I had, you know, three or four cases, they were not able to operate after 3.30. That's the latest, the latest we're allowed to put elective cases. And so I went over to East Alabama Medical Center and threatened to get my Alabama license. And they were, they're 20 minutes down the road. And ultimately they were able to give me block time. But that's something that, uh, something that, uh, you know, you got to get your cases on. Who knows who this is? Yeah, so this one benefit of being uh, the only Tennessee fan in LaGrange, Georgia, uh, I was able to introduce Johnny Majors. We have a gridiron club. We actually had Bob Stoops last night uh, come in, but uh, we have gridiron where we have, you know, coaches and the SEC commissioner was there a couple weeks ago. We meet five times a year, and uh, and so I got to introduce Johnny Majors, which was uh, which was pretty pretty neat. Office, there's different ways to do office. This is something I didn't. And, there, and this is, you know, everybody's different, but I didn't know starting practice. New patients I'd allot 20 minutes for. Established patients I allot 10 minutes for. Um, and then post-ops five minutes. And then procedures uh, that I do in the office veins. If, if I have a sebaceous cyst, I'll cut it out when they come in. But if it's a, a skin cancer that's going to require, a, you know, a rotational flap or something or, or, you know, soft tissue masses, I do 30 minutes for. So that's something for the chiefs, just, you know, setting your office up and, and making sure that uh, everything runs well. Uh, that was something that was helpful, and I basically pulled that off of what my, my dad did. Uh, my schedule on Monday, I'm in office all day, 8 to noon and then 1 to 5. Tuesday, I'm in the hospital all day. Wednesday, office all day. Thursday, hospital all day. And then Friday, uh, I do, or I did, endoscopy uh, in the mornings, and then I do veins in the afternoon. Uh, I usually do, you know, 6 or 7 EGDs and colonoscopies in the morning, four, 4 or 5 veins in the afternoon. And between, on Friday afternoon, between my van procedures, I do office, and, and I put Friday office there because that's something nobody's in office on Fridays. I mean, every, you know, nobody wants to be in office on Friday, so I get uh, a lot of you know a lot of good referrals on Fridays, and that, that helps me fill up my next week. So Friday afternoon office, I don't know how long I'll do it. I, you know, 20 years from now, I may not decide to do it. It's you know something similar. Dr. Burns told me with you know operating on Fridays. I think at some point in time he did some cases on Friday, and nobody wants to operate on Fridays, and so he, you know you can get all your cases done. So that was something that. Uh, a little thing that was was helpful for me in my pr and still is in my practice. Endoscopy, like I said, I do EGDs and colonoscopies. I would say with my foregut surgeries, um, Nissen's and peristophageal hernias, it's increased my my numbers because our GI doctors won't refer those. They, I mean, they will 
patient has terrible reflux or a huge hiatal hernia, and, and they just don't think that those are procedures that should be done. So I think doing EGD has increased my volume for those. Uh, obviously, bariatrics, anytime I do a sleeve, I always do a preoperative EGD. I would say my colectomy referrals have decreased because I do colonoscopies. The GI guys uh, uh, you know, would not refer me as many um, as many colectomies, and uh, so that was something that uh, I'd say those numbers probably decreased as a result of doing endoscopy. So Dr. Moore told me this was going to happen. I'll read this. Uh, this is from my GI doctor in the clinic with me. So I just wanted to touch base with you on something that I've been mentioning to Eric, who's our CEO for the past year, but not sure if it's getting to you. I know that when you first came to the clinic and we're trying to get established, you did a bunch of endoscopy procedures. Um, now that you're busy with surgeries, I would respectfully like to ask that you allow me to do clinic endoscopy procedures other than your preoperative EGDs. So colonoscopy is in most EGDs. Since you've been here, my volume has significantly declined. Endoscopy is really all I have, not multiple surgical procedures like you. So I got that text message, I guess, and I think it was in June. And uh, Dr. Moore told me, he said, it's going to end up being a turf war if you have GI doctors in town. He told me, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And so I went back and forth, and I've actually, you know, pretty much stopped doing endoscopy. I do a little bit. I do the uh, and I'm, I'm going to continue to do a little bit just to keep my, my skill set up. Um, but quite frankly, I'd much rather take out a gallbladder or, or take out a thyroid than do a colonoscopy. So um, that's something that, you know, for you general surgeons going into practice where there are GI docs, you can just be mindful of, and and, uh, and it can end up being a turf war. And I, that, I, I, whether it's right or wrong, that was what I ultimately decided uh, was to back off doing that. Lack of resources. Know what you can handle, what, know what to send up the road. So my partner, Charlie Ferguson, uh, who was, you know, Mass General Program Director for 20 years, he came back to LaGrange and did a Whipple. You know, he did Whipples up there. You know, why not do a Whipple in LaGrange? And he quickly found out our, our ICU, you know, it's, it's hard to get accurate urine output. You know, I mean, resources, it's just, you know, there's, it's not that you can't do the surgery, but it's, you know, resources are limited. Uh, for me, lobectomy, uh, you know, thoracic lobectomies, you know, uh, you know, I think, you know, Dr. Hedricks, the, is, the best thoracic surgeon there is. And even, you know, once or twice a year, he might get in the pulmonary artery. And, you know, if you've got 10 units of blood, you know, this, this it happens, you take care of it. In LaGrange, you can't get two units of blood within an hour. And so I send my lobectomies up the road and then low rectal cancers. And this was, I did one or two early on. And I realized I'm going to get one or two, you know, really low rectal cancers below, you know, five centimeters that probably need an APR or a robotic, you know, low surgery. And so I, I just thought, that's something I probably shouldn't be doing. I probably should be sending those up to, you know, people that, because the volume's so low and they're such high-risk surgeries, so I don't do low rectal cancers. But, uh, you know, as I said, know what you can handle and, and certainly know what to, uh, uh, what to send up the roads. So this is, uh, these are my cases um, over the past two years. You can see EGD and colons. At number six, 660, that's, uh, a lot of those were double, you know, upper and lower, so that's not a true number of how many cases, but uh, obviously a fair amount of endoscopy, a lot of gallbladders. Um, I did not put hernias on here because there's so many different CPT codes for laparoscopic ventral versus open ventral versus umbilical versus incisional versus, but uh, I do a lot of hernias. Um, vein ablations, as I say, on, on Friday afternoons, I do, I do veins, appendixes, those are mostly call cases. I've, uh, uh, a fair number of thyroids, um, colectomies, uh, mastectomies, do, do a fair number, and those mastectomies are both total and, uh, and partial mastectomies, because uh, we would never say simple mastectomy or, or lumpectomy in front of Dr. Burns, so total or partial. Uh, thoracic, as I said, you know, thoracic was something that we weren't doing any thoracic cases in LaGrange, um, and so I've been able to, you know, build up, I, I think that's 30, 30 something, um, cases. And so that's something that I think was beneficial to me, uh, building a practice, and, and I think it's something that's beneficial to the, the community, not having to go up, you know, up the road to Atlanta to have those done. Um, and, and then it, toward, there at the end, you see sleeve gastrectomies. When Charlie finished, I made it, Charlie basically just did bariatrics, and I made it very clear to my, you know, the people at Emory, I did not want to be a bariatric surgeon. I wanted to be a general surgeon, and, you know, I'll, you know, a, a case or you know, a case or two a week would be fine, but I, I had no desire to, you know, just do bariatrics, and so I think that's been something that's been helpful um, as an adjunct to my practice. But 
uh, certainly not. You know, you see a lot of guys that start into bariatrics and they just end up becoming bariatric surgeons. And I, I enjoy general surgery too much. Uh, and this is my cases by volume. Um, and this is this, this is, does not take account uh, the surgery center colonoscopies and, and office veins. But this is my Tuesdays and Thursdays at the hospital, and this is just to show that, you know, I, I, uh, I like everybody, I built up. I was very fortunate to come into a situation where my grandfather had practiced for 43 years, and my dad and my uncle were there, and I, I you know, had a good name. Um, and, and was very helpful in establishing a practice, but I did, like everybody else, I did build up a practice uh, over, you know, over the past uh, two years. So I was trying to think of some pearls that I could, you know, starting out um, that I thought would be helpful. The biggest thing is just, you know, do things the way you were trained. Um, I mean, we're, we're, tra we're trained so well here. This is, it's, you know, we're such a great program. And, and you know, we were talking last night with, with uh, you know, Nico and Brent, the, you know, the opportunities we have to operate on our own. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, just do things the way you're trying. I've had a couple of complications, you know, my first two years. And almost always it's, it's, it's because I've, I'm not doing, you know, I, I look back on it and I say, you know, well, doc, you know Dr. Maxwell would have told me to do this or, you know, just stuff that, you know, just do, do things the way you were trained and it'll keep you out of trouble. trouble. Uh, lean on your partners for office and coding. In my experience, I, did, I feel like I didn't get as much office during training and as much coding during training. And so when you come out, you know, office stuff, you know, this little lesion, do I take it off, do I not? It's nice to have office the same day as your partners because a lot of that stuff, at least for me, uh, you know, you learn, you learn a lot that first year in the office. Lean on your attendings for difficult cases. This is something, you know, we were talking, Dad, he said he, he would have never called his attendings uh, when he finished up. <laughs> Sign of weakness, he said. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, pretty much all the guys in here I've called multiple times, uh, you know, about difficult cases I'm not sure what to do with. Uh, you know, I mean, Dr. Giles, I, I'm sure he got tired of me. That first six months I was, you know, calling him all the time. And poor Dr. Hedrick, he still gets called all the time for thoracic cases with me. Uh, you know, what do I do with this? Should I send it up the road? But, but man, it's so helpful. And, and I think the attendings, you know, I, I think they enjoy hearing from you. And, uh, and, and if nothing else, just getting that conf you, you think you know what you need to do, but getting that assurance from, from them is huge. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And you're going to hear, everybody says this, uh, and it's true, and I'm terrible with it. I, I hate, you know, asking for help. I hate you know, call dad in, you know, somebody go call dad, but, you know, you get in a spot where you're not sure of, just, you know, call your partners. It's, uh, it'll, uh, you know, it'll keep you out of trouble. Um, take extra call. I mentioned that earlier, but call is something uh, that I thought, you know, take an extra call is a good thing starting out. Uh, don't shortchange your office. Dad always told me if you take care of your office, you take care of you. And everybody wants to cancel office and shortchange office, but you know it's, you gotta you gotta do office in order to operate. So uh, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. So make sure you take care of your office. Preference cards. Uh, I started out. We didn't have a Ferguson retractor. We didn't have a Chelsea, and we didn't have hardly anything that I used in. Uh, and anorectal stuff. So Dr. Moore sent me his preference cards. It's, that's something I would, you know, for the Chiefs, I would consider just, you know, getting some preference cards for some common cases that you do and just like, making copies and taking those with you. Uh, and then templates. You know, every time I do a thyroid, every time I see a thyroid, I've got Dr. Rose thyroid template, parathyroid template, uh, Dr. Witherspoon's, you know, breast template. You know, you'll do, hopefully do a fair amount of office your chief year and, and get those templates and those, I still use them. They're, they're very helpful. And then text chain, I was very fortunate to uh, have three guys that are, you know, awesome guys. Also, all three of them went into general surgery and we've got text chain. And we probably, what do you think, Josh? Twice a week, you know, somebody pops a question, you know, I've got this case. And that was something that uh, has been very beneficial to me as well. Um, and, you know, seeing what these guys would do. So we have a text chain where we ask questions and share, you know, cases, and, and that's been something that's been a good thing. Uh, as far as Pearl starting out, you know, be nice to everyone. Um, build, you know, your patients, you know, especially if you're in a small town, everybody talks. So, I mean, you, you treat, it should go without saying, but treat, you know, be, be good to everybody. And primary care, you know, keep them in the loop. I, every time I see a patient, I CC this primary care. Every time I do a a surgery, I CC this physician and let them know, and uh, and they really, um, they they very much so appreciate it. With the endoscopy thing, I, one of the primary care guys, I told me you know, I must step down on doing endoscopy. We're going to start sending it to the GI doc who who sent me the text. He said, I'm not going to send it to her. He said, she never CCs me. 
you know, she never sends me a copy of the note. She won't answer her phone. You know, and, and so, you know, just those little things are, are something that's important. It's good to be broad, but know your limitations. Send stuff up the road when needed. We, we discussed that already. Um, this is one thing Uncle Paul uh, you know, said was one of the most important things. He said, just be available. Uh, Amanda and I were in Chicago a couple weeks ago. Uh, we went to the Cubs game, uh, and this, one of the hospital administrators was there, and I, you know, I got a call from one of the primary care guys. He couldn't believe I, I took it on vacation. I mean, just, just being available, answering your phone. You know, it's something about a her, you know, hernia or something he wanted to get in. I said, we'll just put it in office when I get back on Friday. But, but being available and, and answering your phone, I mean, that's something that, uh, that I think, you know, primary care appreciates and, uh, and as a physician – I mean, that's, that's part of it, um, part of what we do. Limit complications uh, and get used to operating on people you know, especially if you're in a small town. You know, there's just no getting around. I've taken care of my, you know, my best friend's mom. Uh, I put Uncle Paul's port in. I've, uh, um, my office manager took her gall. I mean, there's, in a small town, there's no getting around, especially if you're from there. So, you know, get used to operating. I was talking to Brent about that last night. You're going to end up operating on people you know, even in, you know, bigger places like this, but, uh, and then you got to limit your complications when, especially when you're in a small place, cause everybody talks, everybody in LaGrange talks and you have, a, you know, a few big complications and it gets around. And so that's something else that should go without saying, but, you know, really try to limit your complications. Balance family. So this is something that, uh, you know, we're, I, we're so fortunate, uh, or many of us are so fortunate to, to do something that we love. Uh, me and Amanda were talking to one of our friends who's a little bit older, he's a teacher, and he's counting down the days of retirement. And, you know, we're, I mean, I, I love to operate. I, you know, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and so with that, with our love, you know, for this uh, uh, practice, you know, I think it's easy to, you know, put family on the back burner and church and whatever is, you know, important in your life and, and, and work a lot. But that's something that I'm, I'm still learning. I'm, uh, you know, I'm still trying to make sure I, I make time for, uh, you know, get to Louisville soccer games, you know, you know, get home in time. I was telling Dr. Greer last night, I've got, I actually got a MacBook with a dragon on it where I can dictate at night because if I didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get home from office till seven o'clock, eight o'clock. So, uh, you know, try to balance family with work and then, don't turn patients away. Um, this, is, this is my granddaddy. So this is something my grandmother wrote a book after he passed away. Um, I was walking down the hall at Hospice LaGrange. Uh, my husband had been admitted the week before, and we knew that he was dying. One of the nurses taking care of him stopped me and asked if she could tell me something. Of course I answered and thanked her for her kindness. You know, with tears in her eyes, she said, you know, several years ago, I was a young girl with a great desire to go to nursing school. There was a requirement that a doctor's physical exam report had to be sent in with application. I didn't have the money to see a physician. A friend suggested I go see Dr. Major and ask his, for his help. I did, and he explained, and I explained my situation, asking if I might be able to make payments when I could. He said, young lady, I think you will make an excellent nurse. I'm going to give you this physical exam without charge. I want you to study hard and become the best nurse around. Who knows, you may be taking care of me someday. Um, but that's, you know, when patients come in, it's, uh, you know, it's they always call me. So, oh, this patient's self-pay, or, you know, this patient, you know, and just, <clears throat> you know, don't, don't turn patients away. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll end up taking care of that patient, and then, you know, her aunt that, you know, her, she goes and, you know, tells her family her aunt comes and sees you. So, I, I mean, that's something that I think uh, you know, is important, and uh, and again, it's, it's it's a good way to stay busy. Just take care of everybody, and that should go without saying too. This is uh, Esperanza Viva, which is Living Hope. This is uh, something that Uncle Paul uh, was very involved in. I'm sure many of you've heard of it. Uh, but uh, down in Honduras, uh, it's a children's home orphanage. We have uh, 13 little girls. Um, top right, that's a memorial. That's me with uh, my Aunt Katie there in the middle, who's Paul's wife, and two of his three children. On the right uh, is Lynch, and on the left is Leah. They did a memorial for him uh, this summer after he'd passed away at the children's home, and that's the memorial. Bottom left, that's the children's home that we have, uh, and the amount of poverty down there is unreal. Down b bottom right is us, Uncle Paul, with one of the one of the kids. But uh, that's some. This is something we're actually uh, looking at trying to. Uh, I'd taken Uncle Paul's place on the on the board, and we're looking at trying to get some medical um, 
doing some surgeries down there like Dr. Arnold's, you know, done for so many years. And so that's uh, something that we've, you know, I'm, I'm getting more involved in and developing a passion for. So uh, we got just a little bit of time left. This is our budding plastic surgeon here. I'm going to go over some plastic cases uh, that I've done. Uh, top left, this is a lady who came in with a squamous cell. And uh, bottom left, I ended up excising it. It was a, it was a pretty sizable two and a half, three centimeter defect. I couldn't get back together primarily. So I ended up doing a rotational flap on her or, uh, and, uh, and getting that closed. Top right, this was a guy who had a huge squamous cell on his head. And I couldn't, you know, his scalp, there's just no... Yeah, uh, and so I did. And if you look at that flap, I, I, this is when I called Dad, and I, I mean that flap looked terrible. I said, like, Dad, this thing's already ischemic. And Dad, oh, it'll be fine. And sure enough, you know, he came back to see me three weeks later. It healed up great. Uh, but you know, a lot of these defects are, that we're not able to close uh, primarily. And this was something I learned in, tra in uh, practice. I didn't have any plastics in training. This is something that Dad taught me. That was a squamous cell on the left shoulder there on the bottom right that I had uh, done. Lindbergh flap, this is a, a nice uh, flap that, uh, that I use a lot on, around the temple uh, for, you know, for skin cancers. And uh, so, you know, you excise your cancer uh, and then you make a, a flap out lateral uh, and, and rotate that, uh, you know, rotate that around and, and it ends up giving you a pretty good result. Uh, bottom right, this was one that I'd done. Uh, my uncle Brad, I called and talked to him about this one. He said, absolutely, you know, do not, you know, send that up the road, but it was right on the, on the shin and, you know, there's nothing over the tibia there. And so I was able to get that one closed. It was a squamous cell that I'd, I'd done in the office, uh, this summer. And then, uh, this is, so, Top left, this was the way I had done hydroidinitis during uh, training. We would excise it, put it back on there, wait a while, skin graft it, and uh, started doing these, you know, rotational flaps. These are usually, you know, large females. They've got a lot of redundant skin around the breast. And so this is, you know, this is uh, the arm coming out this way, head, that excise the axilla, and then get a, a flap and swing that over and cover it. And, and I've... Uh, I've done quite a few of those, and I've been pretty happy with the results. And they're not—they don't have to have a vac for you know a week or two or three, and uh, and the patients have done pretty well. I told Dr. Papillon, me and Giles and my dad and Papillon played, and I was telling him I was doing it. He said, "Be careful what you become known for. Get all the hydradenitis patients if you're not careful." Uh, this is my first case. We're running short on time, but basically, somebody—you know, this 65-year-old came in, you know, three weeks chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, White count twenty five thousand, um, and you can see he's got a multiloculated left side effusion, um, and uh, it was really increasing his oxygen requirement. You can see right there, July seventeenth, twenty fifteen, was when I took that. So this was this was my first thoracic case, and ended up taking him doing a th thoracoscopic de decortication. He's got. Uh, it was so bad, I ended up having to make two incisions here, and then I, have, I placed two chest tubes, and you can see his, I saw him three weeks later as x-ray, uh, and, and he did well. And, and again, this is something that, you know, Dr. Hedrick said, Ralston, you're basically you're draining, draining an abscess. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, but it's something that wasn't being done, and, 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 and it's, the patients do well, and, uh, and it saves, saves them from, you know, having to travel up the road and having their family travel. Um, Quickly, this is me, 33-year-old. Uh, I ended up having, you know, abdominal pain. Uh, and also, you know, further, I'd had a little right upper quadrant pain as well for several months. As you guys know, I've got spherocytosis. I've had a bunch of little bilirubin stones in my gallbladder. And the, the reason I showed this was this occurred during Christmas break in, you know, small town LaGrange, Georgia, where there's no general surgeon available except for my dad. And so, you know, what, what do you do in this situation? You know, we know we're not, we don't operate on our family. And uh, this was my CT scan. And you can see my gallbladder's uh, not dilated. It's, you, know, you can see the stones in it, um, a few little stones. And then as you travel on down, you can see my appendix looked terrible. I, I waited uh, a little bit longer than I should have. And ultimately, Dad ended up taking me to uh, taking me to the OR. And I told him, I said, you know, if everything goes well while you're in there, why don't you get my gallbladder out? And I woke up in recovery. I was shocked he did. He took it out. So he, he got my go. And I was lucky I didn't have a hack surgeon, too, because I, you know, common bile duct there, and it would have been real easy just to 
clip that thing, uh, you can see the cystic duct going up towards the gallbladder. So uh, everything ended up going okay with that. Um, that's all I have. I, you know, again, I, I appreciate y'all having me. It's, this is uh, quite an honor and a pleasure to come back and uh, and, and give a talk and, and see everybody. And uh, and again, we're very fortunate to have this program, and uh, and, and you'll be ready once you start. So thank y'all. Well, I have a whole list of things I could say, but we'll give the chance for somebody in the audience to mention or ask questions if you want to. Uh, anyone? Okay, well then I'll start. Uh, and, and a lot of my comments now are particularly oriented to medical students here. Um, first of all, it's really wonderful to have somebody come back and affirm that at least sometimes they listen to what you said. So thank you for that, Ralston, about several things. Uh, but go ahead, okay. Hey, Ralston, great talk. Um, I think a couple of points I want to reiterate is, one, you started right away after your chief year. For me, that was the, the best decision I made, mainly because you're, you're running a marathon du during residency, and you're at your peak performance when you're doing it. When you stop and take a month or two off, it's just seemingly hard to get started. So I think going straight into it, and then taking a break just gives you that confidence of, of uh, getting started on the right foot. Um, using your medical family, we've got our, you know, our biologic families, we've got our church families, but your medical family is really strong. And coming from a program like this, it's deep. And utilizing that is not a shameful thing to do. In fact, it's the best advice I got. I still, after being out for almost 20 years, I still text my attendings and go, what about this? It's just invaluable, and and I think you've handled that well, and and certainly it's it's fun being on this side, seeing you grow and seeing your decision making, also seeing you, which is usually about the third year is when you stop doing it as much because you're gaining your confidence, um, but don't give up on it. I st I still do it, and that's a valuable asset. My question, what have you, after being in practice for a couple years, usually the third year mark, you've got to re up your contract or renegotiate. What what's your scenario, and would you so let's hypothetically say this next year you have to sign a new contract? Would you do it the same way? Yeah, would I would. Um, yeah, so I, mine I got the base salary, and then as I said, once I exceeded, I went on production. So I, I was I exceeded on my third month uh, my base salary, and so I waited six months before going on production because that's what I, and basically that's that's what I'm going to, I'm, I'm based, based on collections and, uh, and my contract's written that way. And, and that's not going to, that's not going to change. And yeah, I think that was the, the right decision. And, you know, it's nice to, I think it's nice to have an incentive. All the guys at the hospital, and they, like I said, they've, they've got great, great contracts and they don't have to do a whole lot and they, you know, and, uh, but, you know, working for, for what you get is, uh, I think a good thing. And I, yeah, I would have done the, the same thing if I had to re renegotiate. For the benefit of the medical students, Ralston, explain to them what non-compete means. So non-compete um, is <clears throat> if you, you know, so, so if I go to Emory and I build a practice over two years and then, and of course they, they've, wherever you go, they're going to start, start you out taking care of you and, and give you, you know, uh, supplement your income and everything because you're not going to start out busy. Uh, and then you build a practice over two years and all of a sudden I decide to go across town to the hospital. And, and that's you know that's the non-compete prevents you from doing that mine is 30 miles two years so if i decide to leave my practice i cannot go anywhere within 30 miles of my practice for two years so if i want to come to chattanooga and practice two years and go back home and work for the hospital i could but that just prevents you from you know from building a practice and then taking your uh you know taking your business you know down the street and and impacting the practice you started okay dr giles uh, no, uh, no surprise. That was a fantastic talk, Ross. And just one thing I wanted to highlight that you said different parts of your talk. Uh, you talked about doing what you were trained to do, but then putting in your contract that you could go to meetings. And I think that's something that can't be lost, especially if you're going to go somewhere and practice in a small town or wherever it might be, is that you need to lean on what you've been trained, but continue to keep up with with what's what's happening and what's new and and I applaud you for doing that and we love seeing you obviously at the southeastern and like that and 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 I love hearing from from you and Josh and Matt and who, whoever else might text and that I think that can't be understated and one thing that I asked when I left fellowship 
course, I was coming back to a huge family of, of surgeons, but not everybody has that luxury. I asked, what's, what's one thing that I need to know when I leave here today that I should never forget? He said, my phone number. And so that, that is, that, I think that rings true across, across everybody, and, and it's something that you've utilized, and I applaud you for that. All right, well, yes. Yeah, Dr. Grant Major. For those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Roston's dad. I just wanted to say I don't condone necessarily operating on your own family. <laughs> Literally, I was the only one around, and we would have had to, you know, go to Timbuktu to get his appendix out. Um, so uh, that disclaimer. And second, I don't always dissect out the common bile duct when I take out a golf. <laughs> I actually think that was right of paddock, but uh, uh, at any rate, Go show you just if, if for, for you guys that are going to be doing that type of surgery in practice, you got to be so careful in that area. You got to get that critical view. I don't care how straightforward it looks or how how you know, easy the patient looks like it's going to be. You got to got to be diligent in doing that. So uh, <clears throat> probably shouldn't have taken out the gallbladder actually, but uh, you know it. Uh, now I'm sort of glad I did because I, I tell you that one would have been an easy one to to have a major duct injury on. Well, let me make a few few points, I, uh, and they'll jump around just a little bit. But I appreciate, it, and all these came from your talk, so thank you for that. I think one of the things that we emphasize here is that uh, we're going to train you to be a surgeon. We're not going to teach you how to do a specific operation. Where we're going to teach you how to operate and how to be a surgeon, and and I think your experience is is, is evidence of that. And so that's something of which we're all particularly proud. Uh, because you know that you have the confidence to learn how to do a lot of things or expand on something that you may have had limited experience in. Uh, Mention in that, I would say, based on our experience here, don't forget about how to do dialysis access. Because just in the last uh, six months, our nephrologists who had a, an access center and who were blowing and going with that have closed it completely and all of a sudden the, act, the access work has been dumped back on us because it's no longer profitable for nephrologists to do access centers. So don't wipe that out of your memory because you may well be called upon to do it again. I think we've got two people here that have been having to do a lot more of that in the last six months than they were for the last six years. So uh, just just be aware that, that depending on what happens in, in health care, that may, that may change. Uh, I have to emphasize what you said about the oral board exam. We tell our residents this all the time, and it's so hard to get it through. And I don't know how much the Osler uh, uh, experiences and things like that tell you, but when you take your oral boards, when they ask you a question, if you will just put yourself in the position that this is a patient sitting across from me, and this is what they have, and based on your experience, this is how I would treat it, you'll do very well. And you articulated that really nice. And Grant, thank you for telling him that because that's exactly it. His six months experience is what allows you to, to do that and do it well. Uh, thank you for pointing out about simple mastectomy. Why are we doctors? We're doctors. Think about, think about your own experience with a doctor before you decided you wanted to be a doctor. They were on a pedestal. What they did was on a pedestal. Why you would ever call something simple that a doctor does, I cannot fathom. It's not simple. Nothing we do is simple. It may be easy for us to do, but it's not simple to the patient. I can't imagine what a patient thinks. If, you, if, you, if she hears me tell the, the nurse, we're going to do a simple mastectomy here, I guarantee you that's not simple to that patient. So thank you for remembering that. God bless you, Ralston, I'll tell you. Uh, <clears throat> the business about call. If you listen to people talk now about their contracts and their experiences and what they're planning to do, it really is dismaying to me to hear that the first concern that people have is how much am I going to have to be on call? Have to be on call. You want to be on call. You're a doctor and you want experience at what you do. Now, I mean, there does come a time when you don't want to be on call as much. But early on in particular, that's the way you establish uh, a lot of things, and particularly, and you pointed this out, those patients actually appreciate you much more than the ones who come to you electively. Electively, they may not you know, think, well, I guess I'll get this done, and, 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 and all of us know this. 
elective patients, a lot of them think they're doing you a favor by coming and giving you the business to be there. But an emergency patient, if you're on call, they thought they had something that they needed care for, and they appreciate you much more. And so from the standpoint of that, I think that's important. Um, Friday office. Friday to this day is still my busiest day of the week because when I first came here, the only day I could always get on the OR schedule was Friday. So I changed and saw patients in the morning and operated starting at noon on Friday and I'd operate till 8 o'clock at night because nobody was up there pushing me out of the way. Coleman's daddy had the OR locked up every morning on Friday. But he, did, he would do 15 cataracts every Friday morning. But at Friday at noon, I could take over his room and operate the rest of the day. And so, you know, think about that in terms of making things convenient for you, but also providing a service to your patients. The Whipple, do what you can in your hospital. And I make that point in our discussion, as you know, with potential residents that are going to come here when we're doing our recruitment talks. And that is, we're going to teach you, hopefully, to learn how to assess not just what you can do, but what can your facility do. There are a lot of things that you're trained to do when you leave here that wherever you go into practice, I don't even care if it's across town, they may not be able to take care of that patient at that hospital. And so you need to be aware of that and put together a comprehensive package because at the end of the day, the thing that's still most important is the patient. And so you think about where is the patient going to get the best care. And you got to think about that. And that comes back to this business of being ashamed to ask partners or someone else for a second opinion or come in here and help me. Now, as Mike Greer could tell you, I've never been shy about that. It's never bothered me. Now, some of you may think that I'm not very confident, but I'll assure you I'm pretty confident in what I know how to do. And it has never bothered me. In fact, I think it's a sign of confidence that you're willing to call one of your partners and say, come in here and look at this and see what you think. What would you do? And so I think that that's something that hopefully, the, for those of you that are younger, will remember. Because you talked about it as sort of a macho thing to some people to not ask for help. But I see it just the other way around. I think it's macho to ask for help because the, thing, the reason you're doing it is you want that patient to get better. And if you put two heads together or three heads together, then you're likely to end up with, with a better result. And I always use Joel Clements, good Lord, I'd run him down, I'd run Mike Greer down, especially in vascular situations, to say, what do you think about this? Come in here and help me for 15 minutes. Uh, and so that worked out good. And then operating on people you know, um, well, first of all, don't turn patients away. That's as good an example of that as I've ever seen. Lots of times when I go to Bledsoe County in the co-op, periodically somebody will tell me a similar story that either I did or Tom Cramwell did years ago, same sort of thing. So you have, an op you have a blessed opportunity to have an impact on, uh, on people and especially then around the last thing, to operating on people that you know. And this comes back to confidence, I guess. But when I decided I'd move away from Memphis and the faculty there and come up here and do this, one of the big negatives that my main mentor told me, he said, you know, if you do that, you're gonna have to operate on people you know. And I said, you know what? That's why I went to medical school. If there's a patient I'd rather take care of than anybody, it's somebody I know who's sick. So it's never bothered me to do that. And so it's something you have a, a, a great opportunity to do, but you do have to worry about You always worry about that because everybody knows in a small town. That's a great talk. Thank you very much for this, Ross. Yeah. Great job. Okay, you, you good boy. Hey, good to see you. <laughs>